Hello and welcome to the MCA Services YouTube channel. In this presentation we're going to be discussing gas adsorptionizer firms and how they're used for determining characteristics of sample porosity such as the pore volume and the pore size distribution. Now we're just going to focus on adsorption isotherms here but there are other presentations which accompany this and cover desorption isotherms and isotherm hysteresis. This presentation follows on from a couple of our previous ones which show the processes and instrumentation for gas adsorption analysis and how we use isotherms to measure BET surface area of a sample. So if you want, please do have a quick look at them as well. So as a quick recap, an isotherm plots relative pressure of the adsorbate against sorption volume. Relative pressures range from close to zero, a vacuum, and close to one, which represents saturation of the adsorbate. As we proceed from vacuum to higher relative pressures, we collect the adsorption isotherm. And of course, having done this, we can reverse the analysis by reducing pressure and collect the desorption isotherm. But of course, here we're just concentrating on the adsorption isotherms. We can view the process of generating an isotherm as the interaction between the adsorbate atoms or molecules and the surface of the sample. And this is influenced by its porous structure, also called its textural properties. When present in the sample, different characteristics of porosity present particular isotherm for features. These profiles largely revolve around pore sizes according to the IUPAC classification. That's micropores, which are less than 2 nanometers in diameter, mesopores, between 2 and 50 nanometers diameter, and macropores, which are larger than 50 nanometers. And these, diameter, these di uh, dimensions refer to either the diameter of a cylindrical pore or the width of a slit-shaped pore. Typically, that would be a carbon material. So we'll have a look at some of the different isotherm profiles that can form as the adsorption proceeds, which depend on the porous features of the sample. And this gives a really good picture of the range and complexity of possible isotherm profiles. As the adsorptive is introduced to the sample tube, it will become adsorbed to the sample surface. And the first interaction will be with the micropores. Being less than two nanometers in diameter, these dimensions range from less than that of the size of an adsorbate atom or molecule to just a few times that. Consequently, micropores will be filled with sorptive very quickly, and this is generally complete at very low relative pressures. We can see here that the isotherm is curving towards being horizontal, which shows that no further adsorption is occurring, and that's because the micropores are completely filled with adsorbate. This curvature is usually complete by around about 0.005 relative pressure, and it's worth noting that micropore isotherms usually start at very low relative pressures, typically in the order of 10 to the minus 6 millimetres of mercury absolute pressure. Once the micropores are filled, further increases in relative pressure will result in the adsorbate gradually covering the external surface of the sample and forming a layer coating the internal walls of larger mesopores and macropores. This region is used to determine the specific surface area of the sample, most commonly using the BET model, and more information can be found on this in our presentations on BET surface area. Essentially, this portion of the isotherm covers the approximate range 0.05 to 0.35 relative pressure. We've used this range here because it re represents the classical BET range, that is to say, the range of relative pressures in which monolayer adsorption occurs, which is critical to the calculation of BET surface area. Of course, we don't necessarily use this entire range, and each isotherm must be inspected and the appropriate range fitted for each sample individually. Again, this is covered in our other presentations. As relative pressure is increased beyond the BET range, we will start to fill the larger pores present within the sample. And the relative pressure at which this occurs depends on the pore sizes present within the sample. In our example isotherm here, the grey region of the plot lies beyond the BET range, but it covers relative pressures insufficient for mesopores or macropores to start filling. Now if the sample has no mesopores or macropores, the adsorption isotherm will just continue along this profile. But we'll assume in this example that the sample is mesoporous. 
At a sufficiently high relative pressure, the adsorbate will start to fill the mesopause in the sample. The larger the pores, the higher the relative pressure is required to commence filling them. And in this example, the green portion of the isotherm represents a mesoporous sample with pores of 11 nanometers median diameter. In this case, the isotherm starts to curve upwards at around about 0.6 relative pressure as the pores start to fill with adsorbate. Since this portion of the isotherm represents a mesoporous material, the pores will be completely filled with adsorbate as saturation is approached. That is, the relative pressure close to 1. And because of that, we observe this horizontal region towards the end of the isotherm, and this is called the Gervich Plateau. An alternative isotherm profile will be observed for macroporous materials. As these have pores larger than the mesoporous material, the increase in adsorption volume due to their filling commences at a higher relative pressure. Once pores become too large, they won't be completely filled with the, the adsorbate as saturation is approached. That's the highest relative pressure we can measure. That depends on the adsorption being, uh, adsorbate being used. And in the case of nitrogen adsorption at liquid nitrogen temperatures, this will be close to one. Consequently, we had observe an adsorption isotherm profile without a Gervich plateau, but instead an asymptotic increase in adsorption volume. Now this imposes a maximum pore size limit to which the isotherm can be used to resolve the pore size distribution. This is often poorly defined and rather dependent on the shape of the isotherm, and more importantly the highest measured relative pressure for our choice of adsorbate and analysis temperature. Now for this shape of isotherm and uh, nitrogen at liquid nitrogen temperatures, the limit is typically around 200 nanometers. Isotherms are conveniently described by the BDDT classification, named after its creators, Brunau, Deming, Deming and Teller. In this scheme, adsorption isotherms are being classified according to their shape or profile. More recent additions have been expanded on this, and we'll have a look at these as we consider each type in turn. Now, the most common isotherm types we encounter with gas adsorption at cryogenic temperatures are types 1, 2, and 4, but we will briefly consider the other types as well. So we'll have a quick look at the type 3 and type 5 isotherms. At low relative pressures, these two isotherms follow the same profile and that's one that does not have a positive curvature at low relative pressure. And this is caused by weak interaction between the adsorbate and the adsorbent. Adsorption is likely to be located around the most favorable surface sites or be due to the interaction between adsorbate atoms or molecules rather than interaction with the surface. Consequently, it is not possible to ascertain an adsorption monolayer volume and therefore, it's not possible to calculate the specific surface area of the isotherms, or from the isotherms. Attempts to apply, for example, the BET equation will produce transform plots of poor linearity and very low, if not negative, C values. At higher relative pressures, the profiles both show an increase in adsorption volume. This occurs at higher relative pressures with a type 3 isotherm. And with the type 3, 3 isotherm, this could be due either to multi-layer adsorbate on adsorbate adsorption, and that would apply to a non-porous sample, or it could be due to incomplete pore filling of a macroporous sample. The actual adsorption volume will give a fairly good indication of which is occurring, as the multi-layer adsorption will tend to be a very low um, adsorption volume. With a type 5 isotherm, the adsorption volume, which commences at lower relative pressures to the type 3 isotherm, is usually associated with the filling of mesopores or small macropores actually present within the sample. So it's genuine, genuine porosity rather than multilayer adsorption. And so these uh, isotherms have been observed with water adsorption experimentation. The type 6 isotherm is really quite rarely observed. We can see here that the adsorption isotherm consists of a number of step adsorption increments with increase in relative pressure. These steps are generally, generally taken as being due to successive adsorption layers on the surface of a uniform non-porous sample. 
for example argon or methane adsorption or graphite. Both of these are near-spherical non-polar molecules absorbing to a very regular uniform surface. However, stepped absorption isotherms can also be seen with materials such as silicas, which have been engineered to have more than one discrete set of pores of differing sizes throughout the mesopore and macropore ranges. The original type 1 isotherm shows rapid absorption at very low relative pressures, followed by a sharp turn of the isotherm, called the isotherm knee, after which the isotherm is horizontal to the pressure axis for the remainder, and that's due to there being no further absorption as relative pressure is increased. This isotherm is found with microporous materials, that is materials having pores smaller than 2 nanometers diameter, or width. The flat remainder of the isotherm shows that no further porosity exists in mesopores or small macropores. Historically, the type 1 isotherm was synonymous with materials such as activated carbons, highly microporous materials with very high specific surface areas. With improvements in anal analytical capabilities, the quality and, and definition of recorded adsorption isotherms has increased and this has been coupled with more classes of microporous materials being developed. This has led to the realisation that porosity may be confined to the micropore region, as in the case of this isotherm, or it can be extended into the mesopore region. Consequently, it's now common to divide the type 1 isotherm into two subtypes. The classic type 1 isotherm here becomes the type 1a isotherm, whereas the type 1b isotherm has been introduced and this has a broader isotherm knee due to the presence of larger micropores and the extension of these into the distribution of mesopores. So this is an isotherm uh, from nitrogen adsorption on an activated carbon sample we actually measured here at MCA services. It's worth noting at this point that with type 1 isotherms we work just from the adsorption data. In order to reliably and accurately collect data at these extremely low relative pressures, we don't just need to measure the corresponding absolute pressure accurately, but we need to generate these pressures with very high stability over quite long time periods. Equilibration intervals are typically 30 to 45 seconds in this region. This is very demanding on instrument engineering, and today we do have instruments capable of acquiring really high quality adsorption isotherms in the micropore region. And given this, we have a number of tools at our disposal for converting these, pore size, these into pore size, pore volume and pore area data. Density functional theory, DFT, or moreover non-localised DFT, is a very, very powerful tool in this respect, and it's now frequently our go-to method. This is the NLDFT differential pore size distribution plot generated from the above isotherm. And from this, we can also calculate the corresponding pore volume and micropore area contribution using the method. But historically, instrumentation was not capable of acquiring usable isotherm data in the micropore region. And as a result, we have some older models, um, some of which are going to be shown here, um, that we can use to generate micropore volume data, such as the De Boer T plot, the Alpha S plot, the dubinin astakov and the dubinin radiskovic methods. And these calculate micropore volume using isotherm data outside of the micropore range. Now, they, the methods remain very useful today, and they're still quite important when comparing older literature. We'll now move on to consider the type 2 isotherm. The first thing to note about the type 2 isotherm is the positive isotherm curvature at low relative pressures. This is due to adsorption initially being uh, conducted to energetically more favoured sites before being located on the less energetically favoured sites. Consequently, we can calculate the statistical monolayer adsorption volume and from this we can calculate specific surface area. The second region of adsorption occurs at higher relative pressures and the feature of the type 2 isotherm is that this continues to increase as saturation is approached. Essentially, this increase in adsorption volume is asymptotic to the volume axis. There's two possible causes for this increase in adsorption volume. The first is multi-layer adsorption of adsorbate on adsorbate 
on the surface of a non-porous um, material. And that's shown in the uh, in the isotherm on the uh, the top right hand side here. The second, shown on the lower isotherm, is due to incomplete filling of pores in the sample. In the case of nitrogen adsorption at 77 Kelvin, macropores larger than about 2 to 300 nanometers in diameter are too large to be completely filled as saturation is approached. Consequently, we see this asymptotic increase in adsorption volume. Now, it can be quite difficult to ascertain the reason for uh, the high relative pressure adsorption in type 2 isotherms. These examples on the right-hand side are real analyses we've undertaken here, and the isotherms do appear to be very, very similar. In the case of the adsorption volume, uh, in this case, the adsorption volume gives a good indication, this being much higher for the genuine porosity in the lower isotherm. The corresponding desorption isotherms can also help, and we'll cover that in the next presentation. Moving on to the type 4 isotherm, these result from mesoporous materials. At low relative pressures, they follow the same profile as the type 2 isotherm. That's due to monolayer and subsequent multilayer adsorption on the external surface and on the pore walls. And again, we can use this region of the isotherm to calculate the specific surface area of the sample. As relative pressure is increased, we observe an increase in adsorption volume. And that's due to pores being filled with adsorbate. And this is undertaken by a process of condensation, or moreover, capillary condensation, whereby gaseous, uh, the gaseous adsorbate condenses into the pores in its liquid state. The new, unique feature of the type 4 isotherm is the plateau at high relative pressures, which occurs as saturation is approached. This is called the Gervich plateau, and its length is variable and depends on the pore size actually present. The presence of this plateau means that the pores are small enough to ensure that they are completely filled with adsorbate, unlike the type 2 isotherm. This is a type 4 nitrogen adsorption isotherm we've measured here at MCA services using a silica alumina sample. The first thing to note is that we can see some type 1 character at very low relative pressures, the, the near vertical region. And this is perfectly reasonable. In fact, we often see hybrid type of, types of isotherms, which do display type 1 character due to some microporosity, followed by type 4 or type 2 character due to meso or macroporosity. We can use this isotherm to calculate the BET surface area of the sample. In this case, it's 212.9 square metres per gram. And this has been calculated over the relative pressure range 0.05 to 0.25. From the region of the Gervich plateau at high relative pressures, we can also calculate the total pore volume of the sample. This is calculated at 0.62 cubic centimetres per gram of sample, calculated at 0.994 relative pressure. Finally, we can characterise the mesopore size distribution. And that's because the pores are completely filled with adsorbate and will become fully resolved, unlike the type 2 isotherm. Here we have applied the BJH model, that's the uh, barrett joiner halander method, uh, to the adsorption isotherm. And this plot shows the log differential pore size. So we can see from this that the pore sizes within the sample range between 2 and 50 nanometers in diameter. The majority of the distribution is in the range 2 to 25 nanometers, and the average, or D50 size, is actually calculated at 10.2 nanometers. We're going to leave it here for this presentation, but we'll just say that we have another presentation which discusses desorption isotherms and the information that we can gain from them as well. Indeed, it's probably more common to measure both adsorption and desorption isotherms to maximise the amount of information we can derive from this analytical technique. If you want further reading on the themes of this presentation, then take a look at the reference on screen. And that just leaves me to say thank you very much for watching and don't forget to look at our other presentations and subscribe to our channel. Goodbye.